So officially our winter pea agronomy program has been completed. Also a program being led by Mark Olson with the Alberta government. They, they ran a three years trials at a number of locations. And the story is, is that we don't quite have the overall winter hardiness to make this work outside of sort of a nice little area in Lethbridge. However, that what we're looking at here is Kevin McPhee's variety trial that we've been running for about six years. And the last three years, every single cultivar has survived quite well here, uh, despite the two that, that are sort of the best that he's been going with. We're, we're, we're just in this nice little area in Lethbridge that ha seems to have milder winters than even out in, say, Medicine Hat. Medicine Hat, our luck has been very poor in, in overall winter survival. However, I, I just talked to somebody out in Swift Current who did have it survive quite well this year. So depending on the type of winter that they have, it's sort of hit and miss. And we usually described it as where winter wheat would have been maybe 25 years ago or so. I personally am a, I'm a huge proponent of the, of the fall crops. This year in particular would have been great to have half of your farm in, winter, in, in a winter crop, I would think. So I would love to see the, the program continue to develop. but. Uh, unfortunately, we don't really have any any Canadian efforts on this crop anymore. We're just continuing with uh, with this because we're suckers for punishment. But we um, we enjoy seeing uh, how how it works out. The uh, Wyndham is the typical variety. We've actually been bulking up some seed of that. So if you are in the Lethbridge area this fall, we'll probably have a have a schlack of seed. If you want to try a little bit on your farm, give us a shout. We put in about 20 acres of it again as a we can actually plant this as a spring crop to increase the seed it doesn't need that vernalization period like a like a cereal would you can see they've got uh, some tall cultivars and some shorter shorter ones but they're actually very compacted nodes they've been um slowly sitting here with the cold colder weather but uh they're they're probably ready to take off and that's sort of the long and the short of it the the good news is kevin mcphee's in in Fargo now, much colder environment, so he's continuing his work. So there's a chance he might uh, come up with some better winter hardy varieties. And if that's the case, we'll keep in touch with him and I guess continue to revisit, but not not forget about it. So that's kind of in stalemate right now. Any questions on the peas? What specific agronomic recommendations do you make to kind of get the crop through the winter? Any specific <laughs> things that you should definitely do? Yeah, well, uh, the timing and the seeding rate, uh, a lot of the seeding rate work that, that Mark Olson's project came up with showed that the, a slightly higher seeding rate was, was beneficial. The, I think the trick is, is just sort of getting it at the right stage before that, that frees up. We've actually, some, some years we've had luck in a dry year where there was very little growth, but somewhere just, just to keep the growing point uh, at the right point in the soils, good snow cover, Typically, the, the, the stubble seemed to help. We had issues with winter harding, uh, winter kill actually in the lower parts of the field. Uh, so the wetter, the wetter parts, the lower parts seem to have more kill for whatever reason. Haven't quite figured that out yet. Weed controls, kind of a bit of an issue, but not bad. When we originally did some work, we were doing the, you know, slight tank mixes with Pursuit and Roundup as a free seed burn down. So, so winter annuals like flick sweet and stink weed are kind of an issue in, in, a, in a winter crop. Same idea as, as having issues with downy brome and, and winter wheat. Some of the broadleaf winter annuals are an issue. But to be honest, we've had no problems spraying it with Odyssey in the spring. It's just you have to spray it a little earlier. You've got to be careful with the cooler temperatures that you have in the early spring. Um, Sulfentrazone, I think, is actually a really nice option now on the winter peas too. So I'd probably mix some of that in with... Uh, with the pre-seed burn down. What's he doing? Uh, stripper, stripper stuttle would was actually showed. That's the one that survived out in Swift Current. Was in stripper header stubble. Yeah. What Sorry? seeding date were you planting these? This in the fall? These we were targeting. We were, we were sort of September twentieth or so. Okay. Yeah. So We've had a lot of problems with dry falls getting them established if it's really dry, but we just happened to get a good rain right at the right time to get these ones growing. Pea leaf weevil pressure is usually really bad on it. If you guys take a look, you'll notice they've been notched to heck. Yeah, the plot's concentrated. Hector, Hector's always looking for a place, Hector Carcamo is always looking for places to collect pea leaf weevil and he's always happy that we have this winter wheat plot because 
they, they, they pick up hundreds in a matter of minutes. So, If you use an insecticide, it probably wouldn't uh, <laughs> if have any effect next spring, like if on the seed day. Uh, like if like you sprayed it in the fall, you mean? No, or? seed treatment with insecticide, it probably wouldn't have any effect. By we did do a study on that, and it actually did have an effect. By next on the yeah. weevils next spring. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. That's interesting. It is. Yeah. Can is this spring on to see on the foot speed? Yes. Yep. Yeah, the flex were a little got away on us on this this plot a little bit this year. Yeah, we didn't. For, we forgot to put that authority down, though, which is okay. We're gonna just turn around back this way now. Carry on. This is our our third year of playing around with this idea of of interrow seeding. It's been a bit of a challenge to study this, but um, last year we were hailed out pretty bad. So this uh, this will be the fourth year that we've done this trial. So what we what we've been doing, we, we, we first off, you know, people have been talking about interrow seeding, and that's the the idea of using enhanced or, or higher level prescription GPS to seed in between the stubble rows from last year. And logically, I guess when you think about it, there's there's a lot of good ideas why this might make sense. So better seed to soil contact, better perhaps microclimate away from the other root zone, root mass type thing. So uh, the folks with the controlled traffic farming are, are, are t talking about that. And there's a lot of honestly um, equipment manufacturers that are looking for reasons to sell you RTK. Um, what we found so far, and we've only looked in canola because it's a shallow seeded crop. We thought that if there was any benefit from it that, that that a shallow seed crop would likely see it more than a deeper seeded crop and we're looking at two openers we've got a pillar laser disc opener so it's fairly low disturbance and then we've got a paired row stealth hole opener we came up with three treatments which were kind of difficult treatments we found so we, we made sure that the stubble was seeded with the guidance last year and then this year our treatments were we tried our best to put it right on top of the seed row, sort of the worst case scenario. And then we tried to put it in between the row. And then the third treatment was just sort of a check. You know, we, we just kind of drive up, snap a line and, and go. The first two years worth of data that we had, we did see an improved stand establishment when you compared the inter row to the on row. So that kind of makes sense. You're, and you can see when we look at some of the plots, if you're, if you're going over top of it and you're, you're starting to drag stubble like this, you can even see in this little area right here that our plant stand establishment is lower. Uh, lots of times, I don't think I'm seeing it this spring, when you're on top of the stubble row, whether it's a nutrient holdup, you'll see a slightly uh, l less green color on the plant too so it's probably a little bit of nitrogen hold up because of that organic matter the root mass that's there so so it does make sense to do our best to not seed on top of the stubble row it's not really rocket science a lot of the farmers that I've talked to that have been trying to employ the interrow seeding have also found that uh, they're getting a better <clears throat> plant stand by not being on top of that stubble row other options, folks have been going on a slight angle to be cutting across that. Doesn't seem like a bad, bad idea to me. But uh, does it justify, say, the RTK system? Probably not at this point. Because in our check, when it, if you're using guidance, the chances are, and, the, and if you just think about it, probability speaking, if you're on a 10 inch row and you're only seeding an inch or two inches, there's a pretty good chance, just, just on base, basic probability, that you're gonna end up not on a stubble row. So that's what we noticed here. Even when we snap, we, we would line up the, the rows right on top of the stubble, uh, snap our lines and go. We had a hard time keeping our, our openers on that stubble row. The big, the big surprise to our results was that we, while we did see an improvement on stand establishment, because we were seeding at a, high, at a, at a good seeding rate, we always managed to get a reasonable plant stand 
and therefore we never did see a response to yield. Uh, the Australian fellas, when they get down to that really, really low seeding rate in, in canola, like we're talking like one, maybe two pounds an acre, I could see that perhaps uh, coming up with a yield response, but at our rates, which are a really good risk management tool is, is having a decent rate, we're not really seeing that yield response. But ironically, two years, what we weren't looking for is we did see better yield when we used our, our disc opener versus our hole opener. Uh, some speculations that we have is just simply that that independent depth control, we were just getting our crop off to a better start than that rigid frame hole opener, and, we, and, and that yield was, was significant statistically. So we're kind of interested to see if that shows up a third year here. But uh, as you can see, I think both, basically as you walk through all of the plots, we have a good stand. Things are looking pretty good. Any questions on this? Tim, would that be the yield, would that be irrigation or dry land to make it significant? They were dry land trials that we did. Dry land. Yeah. yeah. So this plot here with the hole opener is a really good example of the worst job we could do. And you can see pretty clearly that there's patches. What's that sign says? It's holes. So is that, it says holes. Yeah. yeah, that means we didn't try. It's a three inch, it's a, a paired row. So the fertilizer down the middle, seed on both sides. And this is our check treatment with the hole and it's actually a pretty good inter-row plot. The three timings that we have them labeled as were dawn, noon, and midnight. So dawn was really between four and five in the morning, nice and early, and noon is self-explanatory, midnight, pretty self-explanatory. The, the premise behind the project was that we have now the, a change in our sort of sprayer technology. We've got high clearance sprayers, we've got GPS, so the windows of application that we have is actually pretty big. Typically, growing up, we're, we've all been told, get up early in the morning and spray to beat the wind. Well, on top of that, we have really good low drift technology now. We can probably safely spray up to 20, 25 kilometers an hour wind under certain circumstances. The pre-seed burndown trial, we, we wanted to look at glyphosate, but we also wanted to look at the tank mix partners that are going on right now. So when we had first started this, there was the pre-pass, so you got fl fl florazolam. My lips are cold, I can't pronounce it, florazolam. <laughs> and we separated that out from the glyphosate because we wanted to see, you know, are there differences in the mode of action of the different herbicides when it, from time of day. We have carfentrazone, and that's part of AIM, which is part of Clean Start, and heat and then glyphosate alone. In this first spray date, we actually did cut the rates a little bit. We know that most herbicides are registered at a rate that works well under most conditions. So we wanted to cut it back a little bit to see if we can see that time of day difference. Our second spray date, we went at the full rate just because at that point, the weeds are a little bit bigger and uh, likely needed to have that rate. So basically, what we've been finding in the pre-seed burndown trials is that don't give up on your glyphosate because the tank mix partners on their own do not a lot. Uh, that doesn't mean that together synergistically that there isn't a benefit to them, but alone the, the rates are pretty low so it's the glyphosate that's doing the bulk of the work and you'll, you'll see that pretty clearly as you walk across the treatments. This is our weedy check here, so you know that we've had a, had a good weed stand. Uh, this year, we, we are seeing some pretty big differences in, in time of day, but they're sort of all over the map depending on the, time, the timing and the type of weather that we've been having. So it's going to be a challenge for us to, to sort through the, the environmental conditions that are leading us to these differences. 
honestly, there, there are times where it is a significant difference where it actually might come up to a management change. Have you guys ever sprayed the same chemical the same day and noticed differences? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that when we get in those types of situations, it, it's likely that time of day. How many of you guys could explain the difference between, or the relationship between relative humidity and temperature, and you'll get a free pair of gloves for it? No takers? It's not really that complicated. So, so, so they actually are directly related. So as, as the temperature goes up, your relative humidity goes down. And when we do that spray timing, you, you'll, and I've shown the charts in some of the presentations. So temperature goes up, relative humidity goes down, and then they'll come back together and cross. And then when it gets to a certain point, that's when you hit your dew point. And you can actually do out some calculations. And we do have, we all know that you tend to have the dew in the morning because as the temperature cools, the air, air's ability to hold that moisture diminishes and then it, it, it goes out onto the leaf surface. So what we've been, when we're graphing that out on our spray timings, is that four to five, or that really early morning, is that lowest temperature of the day, and it also is the highest relative humidity. General trends is that that's, our, that's where we've been seeing the lowest efficacy, and glyphosate uh, included. And I think we might actually see some differences in our plots here. So why don't we just kind of come down and we'll take a peek. So this is actually a plot here where, where I've seen the most response to heat on its own. So you want to see heat at midnight here, check out the flick suite. And look at heat middle of the day at noon here. That's not even subtle, right? Honestly, for the most part, I haven't seen that big of a difference, but in this certain case, we have. Now you think about that difference, and, and is it going to make a, an impact on the amount of weed seed that's put back into the ground? I don't know. In this case, it's obviously not a yield trial. We're just looking at weeds, so we'll be doing... Uh, we, our visual ratings as well as our biomass, weed biomass. But it kind of gets you thinking maybe there's an opportunity to fine tune at least how we schedule our spray jobs. What's we got going on here? Yeah. Even in the glyphosate here? Okay. Yeah. So come check out the glyphosate here. It's, it's, I think, a more subtle difference. But this plot right here is that dawn treatment again, just like you saw over there in heat. And you can see we've got some bigger flex weeds in the back. I think some of the littler weeds have probably come since we sprayed because it's already now, what, June 5th today? So we're talking three, four weeks since we sprayed this trial. And then you compare it to our noon treatment, and you can actually see that difference. That just kind of at a what rate? The glyphosate's actually less than a half liter. It'd be 75% of that half liter equivalent of the 360 gram. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I said it's not necessarily that you have to worry about your herbicide applications. The, at regular rates or higher rates, they, they do work well. But if I was, say, spraying my weediest field and my hardest to kill weeds, that's where I would say consider not spraying it first thing in the morning and wait until noon. Especially on a year where we're having really cool temperatures overnight. What's relative humidity candle on that? Is that the only factor or is there other factors? Uh, there's potential other factors. There's studies out of Ontario. The question was, are there other factors than temperature and humidity? And there, there's a possibility of that. Certain types of weeds 
uh, how they position themselves in the sun. So the, the, the velvet le weed in Ontario has been studied for that because at nighttime, what it does is it closes up. So there's that physical difference of not being able to hit the spray droplet with it. Middle of the day, it opens up, you just have a target. Mm -hmm. So that's another possibility of certain weeds in there. Actively growing during the day too. Yeah, and yeah, actively growing. Now, I know that, uh, that Bob Blackshaw has often seen good results with dew. And I would say, I've seen good results with dew, but maybe it's later in the season when the, the nighttime temperatures aren't quite so cold. Yeah. Now, if I, you guys can kind of sneak around here and take a look at the Carfentra zone. So as you're walking in here, take a peek between aim noon, aim midnight, and aim dawn, and you guys tell me which one looks better. Any takers? Come take a peek at the AIM one and tell me which one looks the best, best control. Yes. Which one looks the worst? What is that one? Okay. Thank goodness. Why? Yeah. Why in particular would this one look worse at midnight? Sunlight what? Sunlight activated. Activated. Pretty much that's right, yeah. So AIM is also a contact herbicide and it's very similar to Liberty. And I think the message is out there pretty good with Liberty in that you spray it in the heat of the day. Well, Carfentrazone is the same type of chemistry and we're seeing it very, very clearly here. So if you are trying to control your volunteer Roundup Ready canola with Clean Start, and sometimes I've heard Clean Start gets a bad rap, uh, maybe it's because you're spraying it in the evening. It's something to be aware of, you know, like we've got that Liberty message out well, but Clean Start is one maybe that we need to think about a little <laughs> bit more carefully as to when we spray it. The other thing that you'll notice when we go from this trial to our our second seeding date, which is later, you'll see that Clean Start falls apart on the Roundup Ready canola as that canola gets to a higher stage. It really needs to be at that, that lower growth stage to be effective, but it can be effective if it's used properly. Any questions on any of this? Okay, we'll keep it rolling. I'm not going to stop and talk about the second seeding date, but you'll see they're all staked right there. I think the visual difference in the glyphosate and our second timing has gone away. All of the timings look good at glyphosate on our second date. So if you're interested, this is that Carfentra zone again, but the Dawn treatment is definitely the worst. And you'll see that even, even in our daytime, we did have some canola volunteer escapes. <laughs> hey Ken, yeah. we had a good question. What about fungicides? So we started a night spraying fungicide trial. And we're, we're going to start our second year, and we're seeing differences there as well. But they're probably not the same patterns. Okay. We've got two in-crop trials for herbicide, and uh, we're probably going to talk about those at, at the field school. But if, you ever, if you're not able to make the field school, you can come by anytime and we'll show you what's happening there. And there's some trends, and I think that by the end of it, I might actually come up with a, a, a bit of a recommendation on how a guy might be able to schedule to optimize that spray timing on all the different crops. What did you find last year on fungicides? 
It was the reverse, actually. It got too hot during the day. Because you think as fungicides, you're spraying it much later in the season. And if I recall, we were getting better results early in the morning. Okay. Yeah. So there's still a chance for the early birds. <laughs>